uh, they said that global oil demand has peaked, already peaked in 2019. Now we have more electric vehicles than ever. And yet, demand's still growing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were kind of making comments in 2019 and 20. Basically, we were challenging them publicly to, that there is no way uh, the writings are on the wall. There is no way that oil demand uh, has already peaked or will peak soon. Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm here with Dr. Anas <laughs> Alhaji. He is a world-renowned energy markets expert. He's a researcher, author, and speaker. He's a managing partner at Energy Outlook Advisors, LLC. He has a fantastic newsletter. He puts out the daily energy report. I suggest you check it out. Amazing stuff. And you are the one we turn to for the truth and reality in the energy markets. How are you doing? Thank you. Today? Thank you. You're welcome. How thank are you, you doing today, Doctor? I'm doing great. I'm 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 with you, so I'm I'm doing great. <laughs> thank you so much. So grateful to have you here today. This is our second time meeting, and we're going to catch up with you on updates and what's really going on in the energy markets. And we're going to go beyond the headlines and go deep under the hood. So, Dr. Anas, let's begin. What's really going on in these energy markets? Well, of course, we are at the beginning of the year. So uh, when we have the beginning of the year, we always talk about what we learned from the previous year and what's coming up. And uh, w when we go back and look at 2020, 2021, 2022, each year has its own characteristics, and we can describe it with one sentence or two. So 2022 was a, a historic year by any standard in the energy markets, just historic in every sense. Then when we move to 2023, 2023 has two characteristics. The first one, it was the year of records. We broke more records in 2023 than any other year. If you look at uh, oil production, you look at gas production, you look at demand, you look at renewables, you look at hydrogen, you look, anything you name it, we broke records on, whether in the United States or Brazil or other countries. So it was the year of records. But at the same time, because of those records, we ended up with, with the year of forecast failures. Every single forecast failed. Usually we have some forecasts that are really kind of stellar forecasts historically uh, from various people, various banks, various analysts, et cetera. This year, no one got it right. There was a failure somewhere. So although our forecast basically was, uh, uh, for a period of time, was the best or one of the best, and then here comes the fourth quarter and everything just collapsed. Uh, so our forecast failed uh, in the fourth quarter, and uh, it, it literally, it was painful on several fronts because it is on the fourth quarter, and if the balances got messed up on the fourth quarter, they carry to 2024, and therefore the forecast for 2024 has to change. The issue here is this. Now 2023 is done. You look at various estimates of what, of what happened in terms of production, you find out that we have different numbers and the differences are large, which means that we don't have even agreement on what we produce in 2023. And when it comes to demand, it's the same. In fact, if you look at demand figures in particular, the difference between the IEA, the International Energy Agency's uh, estimate of world oil demand in the fourth quarter and OPEC estimate of world oil demand is 1.5 million barrels a day. It's massive. OPEC has it higher than the IEA by 1.5 million barrels a day. Uh, for OPEC, the demand was rising in the fourth quarter, for the IEA, it was declining. Uh, so uh, a lot of confusion in the market, although the year passed and it's, the number should kind of converge, that's not the case. So we have some serious problems coming into 2024. Then we have, for 2024, we have some major issues. We have uh, the events that are going on in the Red Sea. Then we have still the war in Ukraine. 
Europe is still uh, suffering from some energy issues until today. And then we have presidential election in the United States. We have presidential election in Venezuela. And then we have the Venezuelan claim over Guyana, or, or, over two thirds of, of Guyana. Uh, so we have all kinds of issues that are going to impact uh, energy markets. Uh, and these are some serious issues and we can only predict or come up with scenarios, but we don't have any firm view on the impact of these events. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Uh, great walk through an overview of the energy markets from 22 to now. Dr. Anas, you know, you, you mentioned um, some discrepancies and your the outlook was different than what actually happened. Why the discrepancies and what are the ramifications from all that? And with that in mind, what do you think? There's a lot of uncertainty, but what do you think for this year? Well, uh, the reason why our forecast failed, of course, this is not a justification. A failure is a failure. So I'm, I, I'm just talking about the lessons we learned from the failure. Uh, what, what happened is the Chinese economy did not perform as we expected. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think everyone got it wrong because they thought that the opening of China uh, is going to lead to higher economic growth and therefore higher oil demand. So that was one issue. The other issue is the demand in the United States was not as strong. That's another one. At the same time, we did not count for the fact that the Chinese government is really in full control of the oil market, especially in China, and they have full control over the quota of the imports and exports and what refiners can export. And they just stopped expanding the exports. We did not count on that. We thought they would continue that, especially that they are getting the cheap Iranian oil and the cheap Russian oil, and they can re-export after refining it. That did not happen. So the action of the government was not predictable uh, at all, and, and they did that. Uh, we have uh, issues in India where the Indian government uh, put kind of uh, restrictions on exports, which means that companies cannot import more to export more. At the same time, they have issues with payments, supposedly, that at least that's the, the, the story, the public story, issues with payments to, uh, to Russia, that was not counted for. So there were some issues mostly related to government actions and, of course, the performance of the Chinese economy. Yes, absolutely. Um, the reopening story wasn't much of a reopening, and now their economy seems much more fragile than we originally thought. Well, Absolutely. the irony for us, mm -hmm. the irony for us is we are the one who broke the story in the beginning in 2002, saying that don't count on Chinese oil demand in 2023. We are the one who said we are bearish in the first six months, but it seems we were not bearish enough. Absolutely. Well said, thank you so much for that. You know, I want to go to your tweet and I love your tweets. Everyone should check you, you out on Twitter. Uh, your tweet said the Biden administration is buying about 3 million barrels of oil per month for the SPR with prices above $75 a barrel. And then you said, now get this, if the market crashes to below $40 a barrel, the Biden administration cannot buy more than 3 million barrels per month anyway. So two questions. I want you to tell us what that, what your thoughts were when you wrote that. And two, do you think oil could go that low? Basically, the Biden administration already said that they will buy, or, uh, they will buy oil for the SBR, the price it dropped before below 70, and they did not. Uh, they bought it at 77 and uh, high prices. And, and this is not acceptable by any sense. Even as a taxpayer, I think this is too high to buy it, mm -hmm. uh, regardless, unless there are some political objectives, especially related to the election. But the, or if there are some technical issues in the caverns where they hold the oil, and, and we don't know anything about that. I think there was a time when the Congress was going to open an investigation, and we did not hear anything about it. Uh, the, uh, the first idea here is that, they are adding 3 million barrels uh, a month. Uh, so for the whole year, if you add that, it's going to be about 30 to 36 million barrels uh, for the whole year. And let's remember that they did withdraw about 211 million uh, in 2022. 
211. Uh, and that's only within uh, a year. But within a year now, when they do the refill, they cannot do more than 36 million. So you can see the, the, the relevance or the relative uh, weight uh, of it here. Uh, it was clear from the beginning that they are getting rid of light crew, light sweet crude, mm -hmm. and, and they want to buy uh, medium sour, as we discussed last time, mm -hmm. uh, simply because we don't need to store light sweet crude because we are producing shale and we are producing about eight to nine million barrels a day of shale, which is light sweet crude. So we are exporting about four or five million barrels of it. So why we have to store it? why we have to pay for it, take the taxpayer money and store it while we have it underground. So there is no sense of that. So the idea is you get rid of the uh, light sweet and you replace it with uh, medium sour, which is what we need and what we are importing. So it makes perfect sense if that's the policy. But the Biden administration keep telling us, look, we sold the oil at 95 and we're buying it at 77 or 79. This is a complete nonsense because they did not tell us what was the price, what was the cost, for the oil they sold at 95. Because if you really want to look at it from buyer and seller point of view, you don't tell me I sold the oil at 95 and I bought it at 77, therefore I made money for the taxpayer. <laughs> tell me the original cost of, your, the, for, of the oil that you sold at 95. We did some calculations and for those who are interested, they can go to our Substack or the Twitter account and they can see some calculation there. The cost of that oil is over $200. And they sold it for 95. So financially speaking, there was no gain. But if you were, really want to, uh, to talk about the economics and the politics of it, it the, the advantages and the benefits from releasing the oil from the SPR, which is the 180, because the, uh, I mentioned 211 because there was m mandated sales by the Congress. So you have the 180 from the Biden administration and the rest were basically mandated by the Congress. But uh, if you really look at the value or the benefits in terms of economics and politics, that was priceless. Mm -hmm. Although we lost massive amount of money financially, but the benefits to Americans, to the American people, to the American government, uh, what were massive. I mean, what what did the uh, what did the price of keeping Europe united uh, facing Putin? We're going to put a price on that. And remember, we are not, in a sense, yes, there is a war in Ukraine, and we are paying billions of dollars for that war. But at least it's not a big war th throughout Europe and defending Europe, in a sense, and and the war throughout Europe. So what is the what is the price of keeping Europe united uh, in this case? What is the price of imposing sanctions on Iran or Venezuela uh, or limiting their power, for example? So there were a lot of benefits. And then if you look at it, prices were 130 and they declined to 80. Mm -hmm. Yes, the decline is not all of it related to the SPR, but the SPR helped. So what is the economic benefit here when you when prices decline? Let's say if the impact, I'm just making this up, let's say the impact is $20. Okay, just multiply twenty dollars by a hundred million uh, barrels a day, and and see the benefits to the world economy. In a sense, uh, that the American taxpayer through releasing that oil subsidized everyone in the world. Mm -hmm. Literally, it was a subsidy to everyone, but it did benefit the recovery. It did benefit the U.S. economy. It did benefit the world. So, being, I'm I'm trying to say this in a political way, that. Financially, we lost money on the release of, of, of oil from the SBR, but the economic and the political benefits are priceless and they outweigh those financial losses. I am criticizing the statements coming out of the White House when they say, well, we are buying it at 77 and we are saving the taxpayer money. I think they should drop the statement. Just say it. We are buying at 77. Uh, this is strategic and that's what the name of it is strategic and just keep it there. But to tell me they are benefiting me as a taxpayer, it's a complete nonsense. Well said. That's why we appreciate you so much because you speak the truth and there's a lot of misinformation out there. Thank you so much for clearing that and, up. And you asked me about the price. When I mentioned mm -hmm. $40, uh, I am not expecting a, pri a, a price drop to $40, but I am emphasizing the idea that if they want to fill up the SBR at low prices, they cannot because there are technical limitations. See, if you look at everything they've done, it's always 3 million a month, 3 million a month. Why? 
because technically speaking, the rate of injection at that site is only about 100,000 a day, 100,000 barrels a day. There is no way technically you can go about that. You need to go to the other sites so you can go to 300 or 400, but the other sites are going under, under maintenance right now and they cannot be used. So for that site, they cannot go above 100,000 and that's why the 3 million. So whether the price is 80, the price is 40 or 10, they cannot go above 3 million. Got it. Makes sense there. Thank you so much for clarifying that. You know, I read in the news yesterday, I want to run it by you because you are the energy market source and I you're the trusted source. So I read that we're draining stockpiles at about 10 times the rate that we're refilling the SPR. Total reserves are falling, not rising. Crude production falls about a million barrels per day gasoline inventories build as demand stays below the refinery output. Now that doesn't sound good to me at all. Is there truth in that? And what, what is the meaning behind all that? Uh, I think the news, the, the way uh, they put it together, I think this was totally biased. Wow. Uh, th th this is not the way it is. First of all, the release of oil from the SPR uh, uh, it was strategic. It is strategic petroleum reserves. I am not defending Biden here, but if you look at it and the, you look at the economic and political impact, it was a huge, uh, and, and, and that's it. Uh, that was additional supply to the market. We still have about 350, right now we have 354 uh, million barrels after the Biden administration added about 5 million so far, 6 million uh, to the SBR. Uh, that's more than enough. Because if you go back and look at the, why we need this, we need this for two reasons, the, the SPR. We need it uh, in case of emergencies. What are the emergencies? Most of the emergencies historically are related to the hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. So when we have a hurricane, companies or refiners need to borrow some, some oil, we release 30 million, uh, et cetera. We have in cases of severe or, or big wars like the Gulf War or the invasion of Iraq, etc. We need probably about 60 million, and that's it. We still have 350 million, so this is not a big deal. But when we look at the SBR, those who are making big deal out of it, they forget that we added nine million barrels a day of production. Nine million. So <clears throat> we. The, uh, the SPR declined by 211 in 2022, or the Biden administration released 180 million that throughout the year. So now look at it. We, are, we, we added 9 million. So 9 million in 100 days, that's 900 million. Just in 100 days. 900 million. So that's multiples of what was released from the SPR. Mm -hmm. So now we have the share revolution. Why do I need the 700 million in the SPR in the first place? And what, one of the ironies, and for those who are interested, all those documentations are in a video that I have on my, they can check it out on uh, in my timeline on Twitter, where I showed all the evidence, basically. It was the Republicans who wanted to eliminate the SPR. It was the Republicans who wanted to reduce the SPR. It was President Trump mm -hmm. himself in 2018 who wanted to sell uh, more than what uh, Biden sold. Why? Because it was the common sense. It's been brewing for the last few years that we don't need 650 million barrels in the SPR. We have the share revolution. We, we are exporting right now more than 5 million barrels a day uh, of oil. So why I need to store that oil and unlock up that money? For what? So it makes perfect sense to lower the SPR. It makes perfect sense to switch the quality from light to medium. And people have been suggesting this for years. So this is not really a Biden issue, but some people try to make a big issue out uh, uh, out of it. It's not. We Everyone agreed years ago that we need a lower SPR and we need more sour crude or medium sour than light sweet. That everyone agreed on that. All of a sudden, uh, in, in 2022, people got mad at uh, because of this happened. In 2022, if Biden did not release the SPR, what would be the price? We reach 130. What would be the price then without it? The price at least at least would have been 140 for way longer, probably for most of the year and, and until now. 
and and uh, American people would be paying five dollars for gasoline. So why people are not looking at that? So they need to answer the question is, what would be the price of oil without using the SPR? Remember, OPEC, Sa the Saudis refused to cooperate with Biden. They did not. And one of the biggest blessings of 2023 is the failure of sanctions on Russia. People expected that, including the International Energy Agency, they said that Russian oil production will decline between three to five million barrels a day. We said it since December 2022. It's impossible. We studied sanctions. We, in fact, our study covered 120 years. We studied sanctions. Sanctions never worked. Our view was we will end up with some issues related to investment, and that would reduce Russian production by up to 600,000 barrels a day, up to 600,000. And uh, the irony here is, if you want to measure it December to December, the decline was 550. If you want to look at it year over year, the decline was only 220,000 barrels a day. It wasn't even in millions. And the existence of that oil prevented oil prices from coming back above 100 and prevented the $5 gasoline. So in a sense, the failure of the sanctions or Russia held and the, uh, the idea the, in 2022, uh, the use of the SBR helped. Thank you so much for clarifying that. People can be very short-sighted, it seems, and there's like a recency bias. And then they, they read the news and they get swayed. But yes, between releasing the SBR and then the ineffective san sanctions on Russia, which I don't think sanctions ever work. So between those two, we were able to keep those prices lower. We definitely don't want $200 oil. Um, and then paying more at the pump, that's for sure, or even 150. Um, so very strategic. And uh, thank you for explaining that. I want to go into geopolitics. It's another very strong suit for you. You talk about Yemen, you've been talking about the Yemen strikes and the Red Sea. And we talked a little bit about China. Tell us the impact on the energy markets from what's going on with the Red Sea and what you see going forward into 2024 as a result. Uh, since our time is limited, I just would like to refer to the, the listeners to a couple of spaces we had. One of them is more than two hours. The other one is about 45 minutes. Uh, and, and we have some writings on that on the web, uh, on the uh, sub stack. But they can go and listen to the details of the details of what, what's going on. I will sum it up in the next few minutes here. Uh, but uh, they can go to the uh, videos or to the uh, podcasts and listen to them, and they are in the timeline, too, of the X or Twitter. Uh, what we have here is the Houthis started attacking uh, ships, not tankers, ships mm -hmm. uh, around Bab el -Mendeb. Bab el we have the Red Sea, which is kind of a, you can see it kind of a long uh, kind of waterway. Uh, on, one, on one side, it had the Swiss Canal. On the other side, it's Bab el -Mendeb. Bab el -Mendeb is a kind of a straight, very narrow area between Yemen and Djibouti, uh, or the Horn of Africa. Uh, and this uh, area basically is not only narrow, uh, narrow, and it has an island in the middle uh, of it. So it's kind of like really where ships go, it's really narrow because of that, the existence of that, uh, of that island. Uh, so they started hitting supposedly uh, ships that are owned by Israel. Now, all the experts that I talked to uh, and uh, including the the uh, space that we hold, uh, uh, and and people can listen to the recording. They don't believe the Houthis uh, that they did this because uh, of the Palestinians or because of the Israeli invasion of Ga of Gaza. They don't look at it that way. Uh, they look at it that the Houthis basically are taking advantage of a situation to increase their bargaining power in Yemen because they are. Uh, a, a subgroup of a subgroup of a group within a nation. Uh, and the only way they can uh, basically maintain uh, their position is to cause problems and issues to maintain their dominance. So most of the people I talk to basically believe, believe in this. Anyway, when they started stacking the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Israeli ships and then uh, they a week later they decided no I'm going to uh, they will attack the ships going to Israel regardless of their owner 
And then the United States and the UK decided to intervene. They tried to create a coalition, but they failed. But they sent some ships to the Red Sea. So what are the issues here? There is enough power, uh, firepower for the US and its allies near Babel Mendeb anyway. So what the idea of sending more ships to the Red Sea? That's a big question that needs to be answered. The fact is the hottest area in the world, the hottest area in the world from a geopolitical point of view was the Red Sea for the last two years. And if you look at everything I'm going to mention right now, you realize that this is more than the Houthis and this is more than the US fighting the Houthis. Here is what. When Russia invaded Ukraine and then the G7 and the EU imposed sanctions on Russia, now they are not importing the oil, the Russian oil directly. The word directly here is important. If you recall from the previous show, we talked about the details of that. So they are, they are not importing the Russian crude. Now the Russian crude is not going to Europe. It has to go somewhere else. Where is it going to go? It cannot go to the United States. So it goes to Asia. And it goes to Asia from where? It crosses the Turkish Straits, goes to the Mediterranean, go through the Swiss Canal, go to the Red Sea, and Babel Mandip to Asia. So all of a sudden, we have an increase from about 250,000 barrels a day of fresh and crude going through the Red Sea to 1.7 million barrels a day going to, to, through the Red Sea. And where that's going? Going to the superpower in Asia, which is China and India. So you start thinking about it from a strategic point of view of the United States, and you realize what's going on. And now Europe is without the Russian oil. From where they are going to get that oil? They are going to get it from Saudi Arabia and its allies in the Gulf. So those nations started rerouting their ships going up in the Red Sea to Europe. Again, if you are American looking at it from a strategic point of view, there is more oil going to, to Europe through the Red Sea. So you have more oil going to Asia, more oil going to Europe. You want to control that area. That, this is becoming the hottest area here. And then you look at it from another point of view. Now, Russian gas is not going to Europe with the same amount it used to be. And Qatar started sending LNG to Europe, and LNG go through the Red Sea, and LNG that competes with US LNG and will compete in the future once Qatar expands uh, its capacity from 77 million ton to 126 million ton. So you look at it in the future, basically the major competition for US LNG is Qatar, and that LNG will go through the Red Sea to Europe. And then you look at China and you look at the growth in, in electric vehicles. What do you see? You see that a large part of the minerals that are used for batteries are coming from Africa, from Western Africa, uh, and from other parts of the world going through the Swiss Canal. And what China is doing? China basically is exporting solar panels or parts of it, uh, wind turbines or, and parts of it, batteries, uh, uh, EV batteries, and EVs to Europe through the Red Sea. So the, the Red Sea became the hottest area in the world, whether you look at the old economy versus the new economy or the old energy sources versus the new energy sources. Uh, you want to talk about climate change and the policies and what we need for it. It's the Red Sea. Why two superpowers, the US and the UK, have to send Navy to the Red Sea to find a small group that is classified as terrorist group? So it is more strategic than that. And to prove this point, there are, of course, other evidence, but to prove this point, it, the United States decided to hit the Houthis in the first two days to protect the sea lines. It's been three weeks and we have more ships today diverting away from the Red Sea than before. So where is the impact of the protecting the sea lines? So if you look at the impact, we have massive increase in shipping rates. We have massive increase in insurance rates. The cost basically just went through the roof. And then we have delays in shipments because going around Africa means the delay between 10 days to 14 days. 
So everything is going to be delayed. We've seen some factories basically being shut down because the parts they needed are not arriving on time. That's in Europe and other places. So the impact is there because of all of these things. We've seen Qatar LNG basically being diverted. And that's really interesting because uh, what is the substitute? If the cold wave continues in Europe and the Qatari LNG does not arrive on time, guess who is going to supply Europe with gas? Russia. Putin. Putin, yes. Putin. And then what after Putin? It's US LNG. At the same time, the US, when we talk about the Red Sea and why it is a very hot area, we have a drought in Central America and that limited the uh, shipping uh, movement in the Panama Canal and increased the cost substantially. What happened? We have more traffic going through the Swiss Canal because of problems in the Panama Canal. And all of a sudden, the Red Sea become more strategic than ever. The U.S. itself sends some shipments, oil shipments, and LNG shipments to Asia through the Red Sea. But the U.S. basically is an advantage here because they can reroute with a lower cost around Africa than others. But the U.S. basically lost some because of they cannot go through the uh, Red Sea. The final point, and I emphasize this in all my recent speech, speaking engagements and uh, in some of the podcasts and spaces and TV interviews. Forget about Yemen. Forget about the Red Sea. We got really to pay attention to Egypt. Egypt, they have a, a, an economy that is collapsing. Their currency is collapsing. And if you look at the map, just if, if you, and this is for the listeners, if you don't know the area, please go to Google and Google, Google Egypt map and look at it. In the South, they have a war in Sudan. In the West, they have a war in Libya. In the North, they have a, a war in Gaza and Israel. The only place left is the Red Sea, and now they have a war in the Red Sea. So they are completely surrounded with wars while the economy is suffering and the currency is collapsing and a country that has massive population and a country that controlled the Swiss Canal, which is literally the lungs of the world, of the world trade. So the concern really, if you look at it from a geopolitical point of view, the concern right now is Egypt. Of course, other countries like Sudan, Sudan is at war and now suffered more because its ports are not functional like before because of what's happening right now because of the Houthi attacks on uh, on ships. Back to you. Thank you so much for that enlightening everyone. About Egypt, very important points there. It's surrounded, it's filled with war. Very sad and unfortunate um, how it's spreading throughout that whole area. Um, like you said, ship rates are up, insurance is up, and it eventually will trickle to all the people. You know, everyone doesn't see their prices higher yet, but it eventually will come. And there's always data lags and it takes time, but eventually it's going to be felt by all. Um, you know, I want to talk about the global LNG trade. And I know you talk about liquefied natural gas quite often. Um, and I know that there's going to be lower or delayed shipments of this LNG to Europe. And like we said, they're going to be turning to Russia um, but tell us about the LNG, what you're seeing in that market right now and going forward. In general, as I mentioned, 2023 was the year of records and the United States became and uh, produced uh, record LNG, exported record LNG, and it became the number one exporter of LNG in the world, mm -hmm. uh, beating Qatar and Australia. Uh, of course, all of this thanks to the uh, share revolution. Uh, Europe's dependence on uh, U.S. gas is about 21%. So 21% of total imports of gas uh, in Europe uh, are from the United States, but they still depend on Russia for about 16 to 17% uh, right now. Norway uh, worked wonders trying to secure Europe in terms of oil and gas. One of the ironies is the EU is the main beneficiary of what's happening in Norway and Norway is not even a member of the EU. So what saved the day for the EU, for the Germans in particular, is Norway, who is not again a member of the EU. 
they are producing more than ever uh, in terms of oil and gas. Uh, and uh, Algeria is uh, sending gas to Europe through uh, pipelines and LNG. Libya is helping with that. There are some proposals um, to uh, supply Europe in the future to uh, enable Europe basically to replace Russian gas. Think about it this way now. All those products that are proposed, none of them will work. None of them. Because the first proposal was the East Mediterranean gas. That's a gas pipeline supposed to go from the Israeli fields all the way to Europe. Now with what's happening in Gaza, that's gone. That's it. This project is dead. It's not going to happen. So uh, all we have basically is some uh, Israeli LNG going to Egypt. And Egypt basically has two LNG plants, uh, and they resell that to uh, Europe. Here's the problem. If they sell that gas within Egypt, gas within Egypt is government controlled, or the price is government controlled, is very cheap. While if they sell it in the international market, they make a lot of money. Uh, because the economy is weak, their currency is collapsing, they need the foreign exchange. So they ended up with a situation where they started having power shortages designed kind of brownout so they can reduce the use of gas so they can ship it to Europe so they can make money to support their currency. But they are still dependent on Israel in this case. So any change in the political situation or the economics of it, uh, then there will be no more Israeli gas going to Egypt and then Egypt cannot export LNG to Europe. Uh, so the East Med basically is over. This is not going to be there simply because of what's happening in Gaza right now, and this is dead. Uh, for some experts, basically, they believe it's been dead already because there is a problem with borders among the six states in the area. Uh, they need to, demark to, to go for demarcation of borders, and, and, and that's a big problem when you talk about Cyprus and Turkey and uh, the Turkish part of Cyprus versus the other part, etc. So there are some serious issues there. The, the other alternative basically is Nigeria. There is a there is a proposal for a pipeline going from Nigeria up along the coast. Uh, if you can imagine the map, how the cab map curves in Western Africa all the way to Morocco, and then it goes to Spain. Uh, so th there is like 13 countries there, and this pipeline is supposed to go through those 13 countries. It feeds some of them, and then the rest will go to Europe. Uh, or the alternative basically is going through the Sahara and going through Algeria, uh, connecting with the Algerian pipelines that goes to Europe. So, but the origin is Nigeria. And uh, about two weeks ago, we have a new proposal basically uh, for the Nigerian uh, pipeline to go through Libya because Libya has LNG too, uh, and they have some pipelines too, so they can do it. So we have three uh, alter uh, kind of alternative proposals. The one that is mostly supported by financially and, and, and has some sponsors, the Moroccan one. But uh, none of them are Western entities. And there is a big question mark why there are no Western entities supporting this, of course. They talk about climate change, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea here is we strongly believe that none of them are economic. And therefore, Europe is not going to get the Nigerian gas via pipeline. Not now, not in 10 years, not ever. And it's, it is way better and cheaper for Nigeria to build more LNG trains. They already have LNG facilities. They can build more and export LNG to Europe. The lesson we learned last year and in 2022, that this idea of uh, kind of cross country um, or, or trans pipelines uh, carrying gas is dead. We've seen the death of uh, Nord Stream 2. We've seen the, Nord, the death of Nord Stream 1. Uh, we, uh, we've seen, we have a history of pipeline uh, explosions throughout the world, especially in the Middle East. We've seen it in Latin America. So the issue of pipelines basically is dying down. LNG now is cutting the momentum. Uh, when you have a pipeline, a gas pipeline, you are limited with, uh, uh, with, with the customers that you can deliver to. But with NG, you have the whole world. So we are going to see more emphasis on LNG by everyone, while pipelines basically is going to be dead. So for the Nigerian pipelines, we think that they are going to switch to LNG uh, 
uh, yeah. interested. Therefore, Europe will continue to be dependent on Russian gas no matter what. Now and in the future, the percentages vary, but uh, it is a big, a big issue uh, uh, for them. What the Russians are doing is very interesting. I think the listeners will appreciate what I want to talk about now because this is kind of the, the, the Putin strategy. And even, even if Putin is gone, I think the deep state in Russia will continue the strategy. Now they realize full of facts. The first fact is they cannot be dependent fully on China. They don't want to repeat the same mistake they have with Europe. They, they have one customer, it was Europe, cut them off, they are in deep trouble. They shifted to China, they were very successful. That's fine, but China could cut them off at any time or press them on costs or press them on prices, etc. They don't like that. So what they want to do, they want to move to LNG because they can send LNG to anywhere. And that's why you see the Biden administration right now trying to impose sanctions on Arctic uh, LNG too, where China and India basically are helping Russia with this. It's a massive product. Uh, it's a strategic for Putin. But the Biden administration realizes a couple of things here. First of all, the Biden will diversify, and that means more stability for them. In terms of revenues, that's not good. So they want to block it, and they want to impose sanctions. At the same time, they look at it in the long term. In the long term, uh, war will end. Sanctions could be removed or relaxed or ignored. And therefore, what is the main competitor? for uh, US LNG in Europe, it's Russian LNG. So you block it from now because this is your future competitor once the war end and sanctions end. So that's why you see it's really kind of, everything is about LNG uh, right now. The other issue related to Russia is, Russia now learned the hard way from their experience in the last two years that I have buyers in Africa or small, small countries who want to buy my crude, but they don't have refineries. So they are not able to buy it because they don't have refineries. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to emphasize the investing in refineries in Russia so I can send my oil as a final product to those poor countries that are, that are willing to buy from me but they don't have refineries. So I can sell them the final products. So the Russian strategy right now is build more refineries and export more products instead of crude on one hand and uh, build more LNG trains so you can send the gas anywhere in the world so you don't be hostage to uh, China. Back to you. Wow. That's uh, fascinating news there. Uh, Russia is building more refineries and... Wow, is Russian gas and oil going to be the main, are they going to be the main supplier going into the next decade? Do you believe that could be possible? Well, Russia basically has a lot of oil and they produce massive amount of oil equal to that of Saudi Arabia. So anyway, any way you look at it, there are two issues here. And this is funny. Uh, there are large producers on one side. But on the other side, the world cannot cannot do away without Russian oil because you have 10 million barrels a day. We cannot survive without 10 million. Even if we lose 5 million, prices will go up substantially and the Biden administration and the EU will not like it. So if you go back to the price cap that was imposed by the G7 and the EU, what do you see with the price cap? The price cap, I, I know that the, the Treasury Department, the US Treasury Department tried to have a spin on it. The fact of the of the price cap is to legalize to legalize the sales of Russian crude. Because everyone in Europe and the United States realized that we cannot live with very high oil prices. We need the Russian crude. Just I don't want Putin to make more money. So they created the price cap literally to legalize the sanctions, to make it legal for you in, in India and China and Latin America and Africa, anywhere else, even Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, etc. It's legal for you to import Russian crude as long as you import it below 60. Of course, the price cap was a joke. It never worked. And India and China paid uh, uh, $70 and more uh, for it. And the United States said nothing about it. But the idea here is 
we need the Russian crude. Mm -hmm. Without it, prices will go through the roof. Wow. Well, I have to ask you, Dr. Anas, why do they even try to impose sanctions? You know they don't work. They're ineffective. I know they're ineffective. Why? Is it just for po political reasons? Why do they try to put on these sanctions? Uh, I claim that I invented something, <laughs> which is kind of funny because I worked on sanctions uh, in, in my research a long time ago, and I continue to update that research. And I came up with the uh, uh, theory uh, that everyone knows that sanctions do not work, and the evidence basically are overwhelming. And the irony of sanctions is you can sanctions will be successful if you can use the military with them. But if you want to use the military with them, why you need sanctions in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, sanctions are imposed for their symbolic value. And part of their failure, because it's a war, so part of their failure is that they intensify nationalism in the targeted country. Now they want to rally around the government. They want to rally around the flag because there is the other power trying to force them to do something. And when they rally around the flag, their threshold to uh, sustain pain becomes higher. So yes, sanctions are painful. They cause damage to both parties. But this is not the objective of the sanctions in the first place. If you look at the sanctions, the objective is to change the attitude of the aggressor or the other guy whom you want to force him to do something. So even when we look at the, at the oil embargo of 1973, what was the objective, the, at least the declared objective of the embargo? The declared objective was to, for Israel to go back to the 1967 borders. Now they are, of course, they are in Gaza, so they are way ahead uh, of the 1967 borders and, and they are taking over Gaza. And at the same time, they want the Europe and the United States to stop supporting Israel militarily. Well, we already know they are supporting them even today. So these were the declared objectives and all of them failed. But did they cause pain? Yes, they cause pain. But this is not the objective of the sanctions. The objective of the sanctions basically is to change the attitude of the aggressor or the other side. And what we see right now is, uh, did we cause pain to Putin? Yes. Did we cause pain to the Russian people? Yes. Iran, the same thing. Venezuela, yes. But have they changed their behavior? No. Well said. And I want to go into one of the most recent sanctions, Iran. The Biden administration has sanctions on Iran. And you posted a great chart. And I'm going to put it up right here. I have it available here. In the daily energy report that we publish every day, we publish this. Amos Hextine, uh, who is the Biden administration uh, energy advisor, uh, mentioned in an interview on Bloomberg today that sanctions are working on Iran. And if sanctions are working, then why those errors are pointing up? Mm -hmm. And not only pointing up, the, if you look at the difference between 2019 and, and, and where we are now in terms of production, uh, the, the difference is huge. Uh, you are talking about an increase in production of 1 million barrel a day. That's during the Biden administration. And that's literally revenues to the regime. Uh, so the claim that the sanctions are working, well, the data does not support it. Okay. The other chart that I will, I will, I will send to you is showing that Iran had what we call floating storage. Floating, they, were, they had about 70 to 80 million barrels of floating storage. And when the Biden administration asked Saudi Arabia and others to increase production in August 2021, just before the invasion of Russia, invasion of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, that happened in February 2022, they asked the Saudis and others to increase production, and they refused. So what Iran did? Iran indirectly, whether with a cooperative, with direct kind of talk or without, but what we know for a fact that there were direct negotiations regarding the nuclear deal in Vienna. All of a sudden, 
the Biden administration decides to use the, SP, the US SPR, started releasing oil from the SPR, and the Iranians started releasing oil from their floating storage at the same time. And they start selling it. So it's not only the production that I showed you, their exports went through the roof mm. throughout that period too. Simply the idea was, look, Saudi Arabia is not cooperating with you. OPEC is not cooperating with you. I am cooperating. So let's go for that nuclear deal. Then we have other evidence, basically, to show that uh, after the invasion of Ukraine, the Biden administration gave the green light to Iran and Venezuela to export oil as long as that, uh, that oil reaches Europe. And publicly, the Iranian oil reached Europe without any problems. So there was kind of like, direct or indirect communication uh, regarding the oil policy of uh, uh, of Iran. Uh, so anyway, you look at it, the statement that tanks are working is just laughable. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. And great chart from your daily energy report. And I want to go into another chart of yours from the Daily Energy Report, and where you state, and we're gonna we're gonna put this chart up. That oil demand in 2024 is expected to be the highest on record. So these are the forecasts of three major organizations that the International Energy Agency, uh, OPEC, and the IEA. And of course, in the daily energy report, we comment on our forecast. Our forecast is not included in the chart, but it's included in the text. Um, so the uh, OPEC expects uh, a very large growth in 2024, and they expect uh, oil demand to exceed uh, 105 million barrels a day. Wow. Uh, the IEA basically uh, expect a growth about 1.2. Uh, the EIA uh, expect a growth about 1.35, something like this. Our number is about 1.4. So we are closer to the AIA than others. We are way, way lower than OPEC. We think that OPEC uh, estimate is a little bit high. But the idea is any way you look at it using, of course, these are quarterly data, by the way. Mm -hmm. Any way you look at it using anyone's numbers, we are going to hit the highest demand ever in 2024. Is this important? Yes, because Absolutely. many people, including several oil majors, including BP, said publicly, and people can Google that or they can go to our publications and, and check it out. Uh, they said that a global oil demand has peaked, already peaked in 2019. Now we have more electric vehicles than ever. And yet, demand still growing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were kind of making comments in 2019 and 20, basically we were challenging them publicly to, that there is no way, uh, the writings are on the wall, there is no way that oil demand uh, has already peaked or will peak soon. And now we have organizations that were kind of uh, uh, preaching uh, the end of oil or the peak oil, etc., like the International Energy Agency itself, basically predicting uh, increase uh, in oil demand. Well said. Last time we met, you mentioned this as well: how oil demand will keep increasing, and I, this is definitely tied into green energy and EVs, and that's the topic I want to go into now. Um, Tesla report just came out this week. Doesn't look so good. For EV, it seems the sentiment is changing on EVs, and people are starting to realize that the news is exaggerated. And I want you to tell us about these exaggerations. Norway, which is the high, has the highest EV sales in the world. I think they have ninety percent of their cars are EV. Um, I want you to tell us about what's going on there. We talked about it before we started recording. Tell us about Norway. And what's going on with the EV sentiment? Uh, tonight, we are going to post a report on the uh, in the newsletter on Substack. This is not the daily energy report. That's another mm -hmm. Substack uh, on on Norway. And not only in Norway, basically, it's more than Norway, but we are using Norway as an example mm -hmm. uh, in this case. But before I get to the Norway, let me make this introduction. Uh, after the uh, EV sales start growing since 2017, 
we've seen a lot of people buying them regardless of the price and regardless of the cost. We have a segment of the population who believe in it as a religion. And therefore, the price and the cost is not a big deal for them. And even if they want to buy it as a second, third, or fourth car, they want to buy it. Now, that segment of the population is saturated. Now, the rest of the population. Everyone is talking about this growth in EVs in the last few years since 2017 is going to continue. And we were saying all along, he said, hold on just a second. Once that segment is saturated, the rest of the population is going to be price conscious. The rest of the population is going to look at the costs and prices. They, are, they don't have that religion. They don't believe in it. They will buy it only if it's cost effective. And that was not the case. Uh, and by the time prices start going down, and they went down for many of them, by the time prices going down, insurance rates went through the roof. In fact, some of the insurance rates in, uh, in Europe, in the UK in particular, like $8,000 a year, that the premium, $8,000 a year. That's almost equivalent to any government subsidies. And this is one of the ironies, one of the jokes that we've been talking about uh, earlier, because anytime you have subsidies, when I used to teach economics at the university, the question was, who will end up getting that subsidy? Because the, the, the receiver may not be the final receiver of the subsidy. That receiver just getting it from the government. But in the final analysis, someone else is getting it. Who is getting that subsidy at the end? And it seems based on the, in the final analysis that the subsidies are going to end up with the insurance companies, the same insurance companies that been built out in 2008. So let's go back to Norway. So I just want to mention that the any growth right now is going to be price sensitive. It's going to be cost sensitive. Uh, we heard the news about herds and the rental car companies, what they are doing with EVs. Mm -hmm. If any of your listeners are not familiar with that, please Google it because herds decided to get rid of all their EVs mm -hmm. because they found out they are losing money on them. They don't want to use them. This is very important because everyone was talking about fleets, that they are electric vehicles are good for fleets because they have a central location and they go within certain areas and this and this and this. And all of a sudden now we see the fleets basically are getting rid of them. So this is a major issue. But let's go back to Norway because I think that's where the major issues are. Uh, there are about 600,000 vehicles on the road, electric vehicles on the road in Norway. That's between hybrid and, and electric but fully electric are most of them anyway. And if you want to look at the impact on uh, oil demand and um, emissions, when we do the calculations, they should replace 600,000 EVs. Uh, of course, I said EVs and others, but I'm just going to kind of assume all of them are EVs here. Uh, 600 EVs, they are replacing, let's say, gasoline and diesel cars. And once you look at the impact, they should reduce uh, fuel demand by a certain number. But if you look at reality, and we have the numbers and we have them in the report, we look at you look at reality, they reduce uh, oil demand by only 6% of what they're supposed to reduce or what they should uh, reduce, which means that the impact on oil demand is exaggerated by 40%. And this is a major issue. And why this is happening? We don't know. We are still investigating this, but we do have some data to show this. There's a major study out of George Washington University, I think, uh, in the US, that looked at a massive number of cars around the United States, and they found out that electric vehicles are driven on average like 4,500 uh, miles less than the average car, the average gasoline car. And the question is why? Of course, there is a possibility that there is a bias here in the data because the uh, people who are buying EVs in general, they are tend to be younger generation and of certain political leaning. So 
probably it's a behavioral issue and there is a statistical bias in this case. But regardless, still the issue of exaggeration of the impact on all demand is there. So you look at the data in Norway and you can see that those electric vehicles did not reduce the demand as expected, the demand for oil and uh, diesel. And this data, even in Norway, is suspect. And the reason why, because Norway, despite the fact that it's been producing a lot of oil and gas and exporting it to Europe, et cetera, the economic performance of the country is terrible. And 2023 was negative. So it was positive for 22 because the recovery from COVID, mm -hmm. but then they have the R in the negative. So probably the sum of the decline in fuel demand in 2023 is not really attributed even to the EVs. It's attributed, or some of it is attributed to lower economic growth or recession. Therefore, the situation is even worse when you look at the numbers. Worse, of course, for those supporters of EVs in this case, because the impact on oil demand is way lower than what they, uh, what they expect. But the story is more than that. So we have lower driving on EVs in general, and that's what studies show. But if you look farther into this, we published a report last week on this. And, and, and for those who are interested in this, this is something new. And I know a lot of people are going to raise questions about what I'm saying. But if you look at Chinese data, you see that any fuel demand in China suffered. So we have a major decline during the lockdowns and then a major recovery when they opened up at the beginning of 2023. And one thing that was very clear and lesson we learned and everyone should learn is the following. When you have a lockdown and you have a recovery, the recovery will be mostly in something like luxury items, complementary items, not in the essentials. This is important, why? Because we've seen some increase in gasoline demand, some increase in diesel demand, but most of the increase was like 60% increase in jet fuel because travel was the luxury item that people want to do. So this is a very important result. Why? Because if we are in a recession, the recovery of a recession is completely different from a recovery of a lockdown. It takes time. But in a lockdown, it goes up like we've seen with the jet fuel in China. If you move to NAFTA and LPG, you get a completely different story. The impact of the lockdowns on NAFTA and LPG was very minimal. And then we've seen this massive growth in demand, massive growth. And at the same time, a few days ago, we've seen this major investment by the Saudis in China, a multi-billion dollar investment in what? In petrochemicals. Why petrochemicals? What was the most active sector? in China during this period, electric vehicles. And now we start looking at where petrochemicals go into the batteries, where they go to the cars, where do they go into this? Yes, electric vehicles reduce demand for gasoline or diesel. That's absolutely correct. China sold 9.5 million ve electric vehicles in, uh, uh, in 2023. In 2023, they sold 9.5 million electric vehicles assuming that they did not replace any previous electric vehicles, because we know some people who bought one in 2017, they are replacing it right now. But assuming no one replaces them, the, the impact on the oil demand is about 270,000 barrels a day. That's it. Okay, So 270,000 barrels a day uh, loss uh, from the oil demand because of those electric vehicles. But the question is, how much was used in the petrochemical sector to make those EVs. That's not, not counted anywhere. And regardless whether it's more than what we lose a year or not, the issue here is the demand, the impact on oil demand is exaggerated. And therefore, the impact on lowering emissions is exaggerated. And the conclusion of all of this is Demand in the future for oil is going to be way higher than all current estimates, which is the same conclusion we had when we had this discussion in the previous episode. 
the same thing. So nothing changed. And now we have just more data to support the idea that the demand will be higher. Here is an investment idea for those who are interested. If what I said about China is correct, and the demand for petrochemicals because of EVs is going to go through the roof, you need NAFTA, you need LPG. That's the share revolution. We have this light oil, a lot of NAFTA, and a lot of LPG coming of those shale wells in West Texas and North Dakota and others, which means that this idea that oil is going to peak in the United States, we are going to have multiple peaks. Yes, we might end up with a peak right now and then a decline. But once the demand is very clear in the future, that's going to be way higher. We, have, we say crude quality matters. And all of a sudden, we have this additional demand for lighter crudes, NAFTA and LPG, just because countries are going for more EVs. But we think, based on various factors, that the growth of EVs is slowing down substantially for various reasons. Some of them are related to cost, economics, and some of them are related to uh, politics. And we already have seen the debate in the Biden administration about trying to control lithium. They want to produce lithium in the United States, etc., because they don't want to depend on China. China controls most of the, of the mining around the world, and, and especially the processing of those minerals needed for the green economy. And now this brings us back to the first question you asked me about the geopolitics of the Red Sea. Because if this is really the big issue about the future, about the green economy, about wind turbines, it's about solar, it's about electric vehicles, controlling the Red Sea as a major waterway to all these things becomes extremely important because the Biden administration and the EU realizes that environmentalists are not going to let them end up mining for those minerals within their own countries. And therefore, it has to be mined in Africa and Latin America, processed in China, and then they import whatever they import. And therefore, it becomes important to control the waterways. Amazing stuff. Thank you so much for dispelling the truth of what's really going on. And we hear California is mandating that all their new vehicle sales have to be non-emission vehicles by 2035. Then you read news that many European countries are phasing out their coal plants and turning towards green energy. Are they going to realize at some point that this is a big, costly mistake? Last week, I was in Calgary. And as you know, uh, Calgary is generally is cold at this time of the year. But we have this cold wave that hit, of course, uh, several North American cities, including Chicago and others. And we've seen all those pictures of EVs and Teslas basically stalled in the snow, mm -hmm. uh, uh, et cetera. And in Calgary, basically, and other places, uh, we've seen warnings from the utilities saying that, please uh, conserve energy and don't charge your electric vehicle. <laughs> we've seen that in California in the summer, as you know. Uh, when they had uh, uh, kind of uh, problems, uh, what they did, they did publicly ask people uh, not to charge their electric vehicles. So why you are pushing for it if you are saying don't charge your, your electric vehicle? Okay, just from a PR point of view, it does not fit, let alone reality. But this is not the, really the, the issue. The issue here is we ended up with this cold wave and we have several people suffered and people in Scandinavia basically are screaming and yelling, said, it's colder here and we never had a problem with them. Why you guys have problem with them? And I think it's very important for the listeners to know a few facts about why we ended up with a problem here in the United States, uh, although it wasn't as cold as some parts of Scandinavia and they had no problem with them there. Well, uh, uh, one of the uh, major issues that people should realize that, especially when it comes to a country like Norway, that uh, uh, people live in houses, they don't live in apartments. And if just if you look at the population, I mentioned earlier that it is possible that the population is younger, the population that's buying EVs is younger and kind of politically leaning left, most of those live in apartments. So the car is basically is left in the street, it's not left in a, in a garage. So this is one of the major difference. The other major difference is driving to work, the distance driving to work. 
uh, in the United States is the highest in the or one of the highest in the world. That's not the case in Europe. That's not the case in Scandinavia. It's way shorter. So people ended up with problems simply because the distance was long. Uh, they have enough charging uh, stations. We don't. Uh, so all of a sudden, 50 cars needed to go to a certain point, and uh, uh, this is not like it, they were not designed for 50 cars at the same time. Uh, while they were ready for these things uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, other issues related to attitude, because uh, people, for example, in some countries, including Norway, they keep the car heated. Uh, they heat it before they drive, uh, while this was not the case in the United States. So there are some major issues, major differences, why we ended up with that. So in a sense, the change to EVs comes with change in attitude, and that change in attitude did not happen. Well said. I take it, Dr. Anas, that you don't have an EV, do you? <laughs> well, um, I don't have an EV, and I have the largest truck on the road. I love it. I have a pretty large truck as well with a large family, but I love it. And I love your truth and reality. Thank you so much. Now, I, I just want to mention, if you don't mind, I just want to mention this. I mentioned it in the previous episode, but I need to mention it because this is very important for the listeners. Please. Here. We need all energy sources. We need solar. We need wind. Energy demand is going through the roof. So we need those sources. It just we don't need a politician who know nothing picking up those sources instead of the market or instead of me, the user. We do need all type of technologies that conserve energy, simply because the demand for energy is going through the roof and we need to conserve energy. It makes sense basically for anyone, whether you have money or not to conserve energy. So we need any type of technology that conserve that. We need all kinds of transportation mm -hmm. technologies. So we are not against EVs. We are not against hydrogen. In fact, I'm one of the early supporters of hydrogen cars. And in fact, if you go back and see my research in, in 1997 on this, I was one of the first to, to talk about this and its impact on the oil industry. Uh, we need uh, the, the natural gas vehicles. We need all of them. So when we talk whatever I said earlier, it does not mean I am against those technologies. I'm just against the idea of giving subsidies to the producers and the consumers basically to buy something. This is, by the way, EVs are one of the very few products in human history where government subsidized the seller and the buyer. Well said. So we are against this nonsense. Mm -hmm. We are uh, uh, against basically the, a, a politician who know nothing, and let me put it this way without mentioning names, a politician who support EVs in every talk this politician talks about EVs, and when this politician got the EV, he did not know how to charge it. <laughs> In public, you can see it on YouTube. And this person basically is picking up, making your choices. So we need all those sources of energy, but just we need to take out the nonsense out of it. I love that. We need all the sources. Oil, the oil industry is not like a clean industry. We know that. Work, those who work in the oil industry are not saints. We end up with problems, we end up with spills, we end up with, with, with all kinds of things. But what they need basically is we need cooperation to lower the negative impact. We don't want to drive people out. So one of the main issues that people are not paying attention to, and in fact, I have a chart uh, in, in the last speech that I gave, uh, it shows that you think you think countries in, uh, in, in Europe, the queen of green, uh, Germany, or you look at the Netherlands or others, you think they are green? Look, they, de they still depend on fossil fuel by 80 to 90% of their energy. 80 to 90%. We're not talking about 20 and 40. 80 to 90%. That, their dependence. And what we are doing right now is we are forcing new high school graduates to deviate from studying geology, petroleum engineering, or anything related to that, because they think this is a bad industry. Well, guess what? Very soon, we are going to have a major crisis because the world is not going to uh, just give up oil quickly. So five, six years from now, we're not going to have enough graduates, basically, to run those industries, and we're going to end up with shortages. 
We have a serious problem. Several geology and petroleum engineering departments around the world closed down because of this war against the industry. So we got to be kind of mindful of this. Can we solve this? Can we do? Yes, nuclear can solve this problem. And we can get the lower emissions at the same time, get rid of fossil fuel. We can do that. Just we have to do it right. And uh, uh, my, my friend Eric Townsend basically has a great idea about how to, to solve those problems, et cetera. And he, he's carrying the flag for that. But the idea is there are many solutions, but they don't want to. When, we, when someone tells them about carbon capture, no, this technology is bad. Well, how do you know? You never, you never studied petroleum engineering. You never studied geology. So how do you know it's a bad technology? Because everyone objecting to it basically is someone who never studied these things. Why? Because, oh, you are telling me that if we uh, have carbon capture, that means the oil industry will survive and do well. Well, then what is your problem? Your problem with the oil industry is carbon. So if we take that carbon out, then what is your problem? So that's where the, the, the issue is. And the, the, the idea is we created industries that survive on subsidies. Those industries basically took some of the subsidies and uh, spent it on lobbying. They became massive lobbyists. And the only way they can survive, basically, is to chip into the oil and gas industry more and more, regardless of the facts on the ground. Facts are facts. And that's what you're here to do and tell us the truth. We, we need to find all sources, but they shouldn't demonize the fossil fuels because demand is increasing exponentially and we need all sources, especially the fossil fuels. And that's the truth. Uh, thank you so much for that. I want let to me tell you, you let yeah. me, sorry, I just want to mention one, one issue because I think Please. people should realize this. We demonized Russia, we demonized Putin, we impose sanctions and we are fighting them. We are spending billions of dollars and, and sending Putin, we, uh, I mean, tanks and other things, et cetera, to fight Putin in Ukraine all this stuff. And what's the news yesterday? The news yesterday basically is the Biden administration is thinking, thinking about banning enriched uranium mm -hmm. imports from Russia. After that. all of this, the United States is still importing and how they are paying Putin. Are they using the Chinese yuan to pay you Putin? So once you start thinking this way, I say, hold on just a second. There is more to the story than just sanctions and trying to fight Putin in Ukraine. Why the US, why Putin even did not ban this in the first place? 15% of US nuclear power plants run on Russian uranium until today. Well, that's what I want to go into is uranium, the re uranium bull market. And I'm an investor in uranium. And I want to know your thoughts on that market. Everyone's saying it could be a bubble and everything, but it seems that nuclear can solve a lot of our problems and could potentially be a solution. Do you believe that uranium will remain strong? And let's talk about investing opportunities. And at the same time, do you think that the U.S., it will let go of some of its uncertainty heuristic and uh, not be so concerned about nuclear. There's so much fear and uncertainty with people and nuclear. My issue with this, um, I am a strong believer that the demand for nuclear power basically uh, is, is going to be strong for decades to come. But when it comes to uranium, mm -hmm. uranium is a natural resource. And natural resources have their own economics. They have their own things. And people sometimes confuse them. They think they are just like a phone or any, any other things that can be sold, manufactured and sold. These, these are completely different things. And therefore, the same issue we've seen with cobalt and lithium and others, that these are cyclical, no matter what. And when we produce them and we have new projects, think about the growth. The growth is not a straight line. Think about it as a staircase, where you, 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 you go to step number seven, and you stay there for like three years. And all of a sudden, you have this massive project coming online. And you go to step eight, but it's a very big step. And now you wait two years to get another step. And it's a small step. And so when it comes to natural resources, we have to be really careful. You cannot have it linearly and, and think about it that way. 
So while the demand is very strong, we have to be mindful of the production side because all of a sudden production could increase substantially. Once people and countries and governments see a, a strong opportunity, we've seen this with so many times over history. So while I am bullish at this time, I may not be bullish later on simply because supply might surprise on the upside. So the demand story we agree on, there is no problem with the demand story. But again, focusing on it as a natural resource, we have to be mindful of that. Well said, it's always about supply and demand. So as that supply increases, prices should come down. Um, absolutely. It's always a balance of those two. Uh, I want to know your, now wrapping up everything. This is an amazing conversation today, Dr. Anas. You're amazing. I love this. Thank you. Your outlook for not only 2024, overall, you've said that demand should increase exponentially. Oil demand is increasing. Energy demand is increasing. Um, what is your outlook for investment opportunities for oil and the energy markets or commodities this year, 2024? 2024 basically is going to be, uh, as I mentioned, 2022 was a historic year. 2023 was the year of records and forecast failures. Uh, 2024, uh, the way we look at it right now, is a mild year. Here, I would like to uh, mention something important. Uh, we speak for the numbers that we see, which means that whatever I say today could change later on when the numbers change. So it's not like I'm going to hold into my view right now and keep this way until the end of the year and someone might come, you said this on the show. And no, we, we follow the numbers. If the numbers change, we change. Mm -hmm. And that's the, no, that, that's the nature of the market. So as we see it today, it's going to be a mild year. Uh, we have uh, large growth in non-OPEC. Uh, production when it comes to oil. And that's this not large growth and non-OPEC basically is expected. There are, there are no surprises. Even OPEC is counting for that. The problem is demand is not going to grow as much as OPEC wants. So what we see that Saudi Arabia and Russia and their allies within OPEC plus, they have voluntary cuts that will end at the end of March. And if they want to maintain the market as is, they need to extend that either to June or to the end of the year. So we are expecting an extension if they want to keep prices this way. Some people are raising the possibility of a price war. We have a full report on this because when we studied the history of price wars, we discovered that uh, there are conditions that should exist before a price war. And we have a full report on Substack on that. And those conditions do not exist today. If they exist in the future, we will let people know when Saudis basically decides to crash the market. But again, there are several conditions needed for that decision to be made. Uh, so it's going to be a mild year. Where do you see prices today? That's where they are going to fluctuate uh, around. Uh, we don't see $100 oil in 2024 unless we have a major disruption in oil supplies. When we talk about major disruption, basically, we want to see something happening to capacity. It's not like just the news. We, we need to see uh, that capacity being destroyed or affected uh, until prices go up that high. Those who are predicting $150 oil because of what's happening in the Red Sea, they have no case. And here is why. The amount of oil that goes through the Babel Mandib is between five to six million barrels a day. And we are not going to lose all of it, basically. It's going to be rerouted. So we have just delays in this case. But if you go back to September 2019, when Aramco was hit, we lost, we lost. that was a total loss of 5.5 million barrels a day. So that cannot be rerouted, just kind of, we lost that 5.5. And yet prices went up by only $20. We are at 80, 81 today. So even if we lose 5 million, you are going to go to 100. But there is no reason to go to 130. Because even if you go earlier to previous events, there is no support for that. And finally, the final point is the economies of the world cannot handle that price, which means that we are going to see demand growth being shaved. And will the Biden administration use the SPR? You better believe it. 
There is a lot of oil in the SBR and the Biden administration. The, the law since the 1977 until now changed several times. And now basically any politician in the White House, any president in the White House can use the SBR for any reason. It used to be for emergency, but that's changed. Now, anything tactical, anything uh, related to uh, uh, those strategic issues related to the economy or related to geopolitics, is how they can use the SBR. So if oil prices are going to go up uh, to 95 and above uh, in the summer of 2024, you will see the Biden administration using the SBR, and they might release 30 to 60 million barrels a day. Uh, sorry, not a day, <laughs> 30 to 60, <laughs> that's total. But uh, the idea is the Biden administration is trying, and this is my guess, uh, if there is no issues with the caverns themselves, there are no structural issues, uh, they can literally release 30 million, let's say in August, uh, out of the SBR without any problems at all. And therefore they can influence the market that, that and uh, it's not necessarily that prices will go down, but at least they will pre prevent them from going up. Thank you so much for that. Uh, seems that mild year as of right now, January, we're at the end of January, um, seems that it's going to be like a range bound and nothing too crazy on the other side. Uh, thank you so much for that. Any Welcome. thoughts on equities? I know you're an economist as well. And, you know, the market and any thoughts on equities, tech, um, how the market's been doing lately? I guess there's a lot. Of I am. I am not really I am not the right person on this, but I am. Uh, still uh, interested in the uh, Canadian oil companies. Mm. Uh, we have the Trans Mountain Pipeline is going to open very soon. They started filling it up, I think, today or yesterday. Uh, the, the, the companies in general, regardless of the T TXM or the Trans Mountain Pipeline, uh, they are very interesting companies. Uh, uh, so I am I'm still interested in the Canadian oil companies. Very nice. And then we spoke last time about the Canadian oil companies. So great thoughts there. Uh, thank you so much for everything. We really appreciate you coming on the show and telling us what's really going on in the energy markets, Dr. Anas. Thank You're you. You're welcome. I would like to uh, repeat what I said in the previous show Please for the followers and for the new followers who are going to follow me on Twitter out of the show. I tweet a lot of things in Arabic. And some of them are breaking news on some of them a news that does not exist anywhere. And I tweet uh, a lot of things from Ataqa, uh, A-T-T-A-Q-A, which is the only uh, energy-focused media outlet in Arabic. Twitter has a function on the left, on the bottom left of every tweet, which is the translate function. So when you mm -hmm. see a tweet in Arabic, don't say, well, I'm not going to follow this guy or I'm going to read it, et cetera. Just press that, uh, click on that translate, and you will see the tweet in the language you like, whatever your computer is set on. So if it's English, you can see the translation in English. So you can read it as if I tweeted in English, or the original tweet that I forwarded or retweeted basically is in uh, English. So all you got to do, just utilize that translate uh, button, and uh, uh, I think you, you'll love it. I love it. Yes, I'm doing it right now with one of your most recent tweets. Um, great, great idea. Thank you so much for letting the listeners know. I actually did not even know that. And you had sent me a tweet and I wasn't able to read it. I didn't even think of clicking the translate. So good, good thoughts there. And Dr. Anas, could you please tell the listeners how they can follow you? Um, we have you on Twitter. I'm going to put your, your um, handle in the description. But tell us about your daily energy report and your Substack. Sure. I do have a website, but the website is not being updated for a long time, but still have some interesting things. For those who would like to schedule me for speeches, they can go to the website. There is a form to fill out or reach out uh, via Twitter, and I'll be happy to communicate with you. Uh, on the Substacks, basically, we do have two sets of Substacks. Uh, the one which is the, the the newsletter, the newsletter we send about four or five newsletters a week, uh, and it is in depth, just like the issue of Norway EVs, etc. That we are going to release tonight, or the global oil demand and the global oil production that we released in the last ten days or so. Uh, we uh, talk a lot about uh, uh, the future of uh, energy 
LNG, we have every week, we have gas and LNG report in details. Uh, Europe, uh, we talk about uh, Nigeria. Uh, we, the, the last report we released on uh, LNG was the impact of the uh, Red Sea troubles on the LNG industry. Uh, so all of that in the newsletter. Uh, and people can ask their companies basically to subscribe to that newsletter. And then we have the daily energy report. It's very cheap. Uh, this is for everyone, uh, uh, simply because there are too many. There is a lot of competition on these things there, so uh, people if uh, they can subscribe to it, it's not that expensive. And uh, uh, we, what we do with it is, it's, it's four segments. We have the chart of the day. We bring some crazy ideas, uh, but they are very important in the chart of the day. And then we have the story of the day. It's a story that we think it's important, not what the market thinks. Uh, and then we cover the news and we comment on this news in details, sometimes with data and charts. Uh, and, and we just clarify what the news is. Uh, and, and many times we say this is fake and, or this is nonsense or uh, this is kind of uh, all the news being uh, reposted because of lazy journalism or whatever. We say that. Uh, and then we have news items without any explanations. We think that those who are interested, they can just read the uh, news items. So this is what the Daily Energy Report is. Love that. Always speaking the truth in the energy markets. Thank you so much, Dr. Anas. And I'll be putting all those links in the description. And hopefully we'll be meeting again in a little bit this sometime this year and we can get more energy market updates. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you to all the listeners.